My name is Manos Brilakis, and in this presentation, we will examine different ways for delivering balloons and stents during percutaneous coronary intervention. These are my disclosures. The first thing to do before trying anything discussed in this presentation is to make sure that your guide wire is actually where you intend it to be, that is in the distal true lumen. And that's achieved by using two orthogonal projections because if you don't, and the wire is either in the pericardium or in a small side branch, that can cause a problem if you cross that into that segment using a balloon or a stat. Assuming that's taken care of, the problem is that we have an equipment, balloon or stand, that cannot cross through a lesion. How can we fix that? One option is to use um, techniques that modify the lesion and enlarge the lumen, so there is a more space for the device to cross. The second one is by applying more force, having more force, pushing and forcing the equipment to go through the stenosis. And the third option is by using different equipment that has a lower profile and therefore can feel better through that area of stenosis. Starting first with lesion modification, how can this happen? Obviously, the most uh, easy and straightforward way is to use additional balloon angioplasty. When this applies to lesions where the balloon cannot cross, however, it can be a little more challenging. And in those lesions, which are called balloon uncrossable occlusions, the problem is um, that they can be calcified with small profile entry. And one way to deal with them is to advance a very small balloon, a 1.2 or 1.5 millimeter balloon into the lesion, and then inflate a high pressure and see that it modifies the entrance into the lesion enough to allow you to advance the balloon further down. If this does not work, however, the next step is to do what's called grenadoplasty, which is inflating the balloon at high pressure until it ruptures. If that doesn't work, then we can do other things like different microcutters or wire cutting. This is here an example of how grenadoplasty looks like. It's a small balloon, cannot cross through that very calcified proximal right coronary artery, and once it ruptures, you see the small branches, the good marginals filling in with contrast. It's otherwise called BAM or balloon assisted microdissection. And although it appears a little barbaric, it's actually fairly safe with very low risk of perforation or causing a complication. Moving on to microcatheters, there are several types currently clinically available. The one originally developed for this problem, which uh, allows the lesion to be expanded and accommodate more equipment, is, is the tornus. The tornus is advanced by turning counterclockwise and withdrawn by turning clockwise and comes into two sizes, 2.1 2 and 2.6 French, and provides good support, essentially screws itself into the lesion, creating a channel for the equipment to follow. Another microcatheter is the Corsair, or the channel dilator, which is mainly used for retrograde CTO PCI, but can also be used in balloon uncrossable occlusions or lesions. With this very low entry profile, it can advance through and create a larger lumen. In contrast to the tornus, the Corsair can be advanced turning in either direction. Another microcatheter is the fine cross, which has a very low entrance profile and high flexibility. Another new one is a turnpike from Bachelor Solutions, a catheter that has a triple wire construction that allows very good transmission of the torque from the proximal to the distal end. Last, we have a new hybrid microcatheter, which is a combination of microcatheter with a balloon called the threader from Boston Scientific. And what this catheter shows is that there is a balloon on the tip. It's a 1.2 by 12 millimeter balloon with a very low entry profile, and then the shaft is uh, fairly reinforced, allowing also excellent pushability. There is also a hydrophilic coating that facilitates crossing through tight occlusions. A different technique is the so-called wire cutting technique to modify the plaque. This is done by advancing two guide wires through the occlusion, then a one-to-one -one sized balloon is advanced adjacent to the entrance into the lesion, and then the second guide wire is actually withdrawn while the balloon is applying pressure, effectively creating a cut into the proximal part of the plaque, modifying, modifying it and facilitating entry to the plaque. Moving on to techniques that can increase support of the guide catheters. We have techniques such as using a large and supportive shape microcatheter, for example, an amplitude one guide. 
And this has been a long-standing plea of interventionists doing complex interventions that if you want to have your case go more smoothly, it's best to start with big, excellent support, such as an eight friends ambulance what ambulance one guide for the right coronary artery, for example. Other ways to increase support is to use guide catheter extensions. We currently have two types available in the US. We have the guide liner that is available in three sizes, actually four sizes, 5.5, 6, 7, and 8, and the Godzilla that's available only in six friends. Extra care should be taken when those guide catheter extensions are used to avoid damage of equipment when it advances through the proximal collar to enter the extension tubing. Another way is to use one of the various anchor techniques. This is an illustration of the side branch anchor in which a guide wire is advanced in a small side branch. A small balloon is advanced and inflated at low pressure, effectively anchoring the guide and facilitating undergrade delivery. This is an example of a right coronary um, artery high-grade occlusion. The balloon crossed, but the stent could not cross. We tried to deliver a guideline, but couldn't deliver any further in spite of using a distal anchor technique. What could be done to deliver the guideliner further is actually to inflate the balloon halfway inside the balloon and halfway outside and try to advance the guide catheter extension while the balloon is being deflated. However, another way that just recently became available is use of the so-called navigation catheter, which effectively is a dilator advanced through the microcatheter, through the guide catheter extension, that allows it to track along the vessel. In this particular case, we didn't have this, so what we did is the distal anchoring technique. This technique uses two guide wires. A balloon is advanced over one of the guide wires and inflated distally, effectively pinning the other guide wire across the coronary artery wall. And then over the second guide wire, as you can see, we can now advance the stand all the way down to the area of the occlusion. This was done three times in our case, leading to a nice delivery and uh, an excellent final geographic result. There are also several combinations that can be used. Combinations of modification of the plaque and increasing guide cutter support. And one of the first such reports is from Ajay Kirtan, showing that using together the anchor technique as well as the tornus catheter, the, uh, he was able to uh, cross a balloon and crossable CTO. This is another example of a high-grade distal right coronary artery lesion. Tried to use a guideline, but it was not successful. In this particular case, we exchanged the guide catheter from a JR4 to an 8 friends Amplance 1 over an Ironman guide wire. After doing that, we still couldn't deliver, but then after using a combination of a side branch anchor as well as um, a uh, extra balloon dilations, we're able to eventually deliver a stand down in the coronary artery, again achieving a nice and geographic result. A third line technique for facilitating delivery is to modify the lesion with more aggressive strategies than balloons and microcatheters which is using laser and atherectomy. The laser can be very useful because it does not require exchange of the guide wire for a specialized guide wire as needed in um, atherectomy. The laser can go over the standard 0.014 guide wire. And what's interesting is that sometimes, even though the laser catheter itself, which is fairly bulky, may not cross through the lesion, sometimes it modifies the lesion enough enabling subsequent crossing with a balloon catheter. Atherectomy comes in two flavors. One is rotational and orbital atherectomy. And both can not only facilitate delivery, but also, and sometimes even more importantly, they can facilitate better expansion of the stents that we're going to deploy. One of the caveats is that to use either technique, we have to change the 0.014 guide wire for either a 0.012 for orbital or a 0.09 for rotational atherectomy guide wire to allow us to use these devices. And moving on to the last, um, the most aggressive strategies to enable delivery, these are the so-called subintimal techniques. 
which are techniques developed for CTO and geoplasty, uh, but can come in hand in other situations, although many of those uh, challenges with delivery come in those complex CTO lesions. The third approach for increasing the deliverability is to actually try to deliver something different. So if the original balloon or stand cannot be delivered, one can use either a low-profile balloon or a shorter stand or balloon or a different type of stand or balloon or sometimes bending the stand. So by doing that, one might be able to get the devices through the occlusion. Here's some final thoughts. First, to be able to deliver, one has to be creative. It makes no sense to be trying for 20, 30, 40 minutes the exact same thing because, as Einstein said, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So if something doesn't work, then don't waste too much time. How much time you're going to spend depends on your experience, but the point is you're going to be moving very quickly into an alternative strategy to facilitate success. Second, know what to do and also have available the necessary equipment. It does no good to be aware of the guide catheter extensions or the atherectomy if you don't have them stocked in your cath lab where you actually need it. And like everything else, this is an area that is, uh, that is evolving all the time. And uh, reading and participating in meetings and observing other operators or discussing with other operators, it's one way to never stop learning and getting better. And last but not least, being persistent. Some lesions can be very tough, can take extra time, but as long as radiation and contrast dose are under control, then it's best to be persistent to achieve the desired results.